Dear congregation, if you were in Australia a few weeks ago and you had pulled out your iPhone and used Apple Maps to get directions to a city named Mildura, the Apple Maps would have led you instead to Murray Sunset National Park, 44 miles away, away from where you actually should have gone. For some reason, a screenshot taken a few weeks ago of iPhone's Apple mapping showed a severe problem. And people were led instead into this very hot city where it gets to be 115 degrees in this national park at this time of the year. And the police issued a statement. We, the police, are extremely concerned as there's no water supply within the park and temperatures reach as high as 115 degrees Fahrenheit, making this a potentially life-threatening issue. In fact, the police rescued six people from certain death in this remote state park where they ended in this desert sand by following the wrong map where there was no food and no water. And dear congregation, if we follow the wrong map, if we follow this world's map rather than God's scriptural map, we will end in a place hotter than Mildura, a place we call hell, a place from where there's no return and no place to rescue. But now on the last Sabbath of this year, God utters yet another call to you to flee, to repent, and to believe the gospel. Before the trumpets of the angels sound and the beginnings of the final judgment arrives, we, preachers of the gospel, are called to trumpet to you with a clear sound once more. Make haste for your life's sake. Don't go into 2013 with unrepented sin. Don't follow this world's map that somehow things will end up okay for you without a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Make haste for your life's sake before the trumpets that we now shall hear about shall sound. Words of our text this evening are Revelation 8. I'll read particularly verse 2 and 3 again. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Well, with God's help, I want to speak with you this evening about angels, prayers, and trumpets. Angels, prayers, and trumpets. And two thoughts. First, when the angels' prayers, rather, when the saints' prayers ascend. Verses 1 through 6. And second, when the angels' trumpets sound. Verses 7 through 13. When the saints' prayers ascend, when the angels' trumpets sound. This evening, we come to the opening of the seventh seal and to a new cycle of visions. You recall, perhaps, that the seventh seal continues the theme of the sixth seal, which already began to unveil the beginning of the final judgment by showing us the dreadful cries of the ungodly as they face their imminent judgment, calling for rocks and hills and mountains to fall on them and hide them from the wrath of the Lamb. Chapter 6. And at the same time, 
We saw the gracious reward of the godly in chapter 7. As they, having persevered until the end, were enabled to stand before God in robes made white in the blood of the Lamb. And now when heaven opens, when the Lamb opens the seventh seal in heaven, chapter 8 begins this way. There was a period of silence about half an hour. Now that silence has been variously interpreted by a whole variety of commentators. The best interpretation, no doubt, is this, that just as everything else seems to point back to the Old Testament in the book of Revelation, and then take that and put it in apocalyptic and prophetic literature in the New, so we are to look in the Old Testament, what is symbolized by holy and sacred silence. And there we find two very important things. The Old Testament associates silence with divine judgment. Habakkuk 2 verse 20 says, But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. And Zechariah 2, 13 says, Be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. And it pictures the Lord in his temple, in heaven, executing judgment. And so this execution results now in a profound silence of awe at the presence of the majesty of the living God. It's the silence of a calm before the storm of his dreadful judgments are about to be poured out. And even the angels in heaven fall silent at the magnitude and immensity of the judgments to come. All of heaven is all struck into silence at the prospect of the judgments of God. But secondly, there is a positive side to this silence. It is not only the silence of judgment, but also the silence of reverence for sacred prayer. Boys and girls, I think you know what it's like in your family if someone comes late for a meal and they've got to say a silent prayer, you all say to each other, shh, shh, he's going to pray. And your brother or your sister has a silent prayer, everyone is quiet. Well, here the silence is reversed. Silence is an indication that God and all of heaven, God and all of heaven hears the suffering saints as they cry out to God in holy prayer. God symbolically quiets the heavens, as it were, to hear the prayers of his children. The silence of God and heaven indicate here that God hears the prayers of true believers. And that's why immediately following this silence, there is a kind of prologue at the end of this opening of the seventh seal that speaks about the prayers of the people of God before we actually enter into the new visions where the trumpets sound, the seven trumpets. And this prologue in verses 2 through 5 is really a beautiful section in a beautiful book teaching us about the value of prayer. Something we need all year long, but especially at the end of a year as we commit our year to God, our sins, our needs, our thanksgivings in prayer. And I want to look with you this evening at six things these verses teach us about the beauty of prayer. The first is the point of prayer, the point of prayer. Sometimes people ask the question, what is the point of prayer? You probably asked that question too. Well, the context here is very significant. 
We've been looking, haven't we, at Jesus Christ opening seven seals. We saw the book in his hand, the book of God's eternal decrees, and he's opened one seal after another as things have transpired upon the earth from the beginning to the end. This is the book of God's decrees, his sovereign decrees, and we've seen that all that God decrees will take place. But what then is the point of praying? Why would God attach prayer at the very end of the opening of the seals? Why would prayer itself really be the opening of the seventh seal, the content of it? If God has decreed everything from the beginning to the ending, what does your prayer mean? What does my prayer matter? Well, the answer of Revelation 8 is it matters in every way. Because God has not only ordained the ends of all things, but also the means to the end. And the means that he uses to fulfill his decrees are particularly the prayers of the saints. And that is our encouragement this evening. Now, that is true, of course, of all the means of grace. We don't say, do we? Well, there's no sense going out to evangelize because God knows who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved. Therefore, it doesn't make any difference. No, we understand that God uses means, the means of evangelizing someone, to bring in the lost in accord with his decree. Well, so it is with prayer. Prayer doesn't change things in terms of changing God's mind, but prayer is the very means that God has decreed so that God's purposes would be worked out in this world. Therefore, prayer is absolutely essential. In mysterious ways beyond our comprehension, God uses our prayers, dear congregation, to fulfill his eternal decree. So your prayers and mine, if we're believers, are intimately bound up with what is going on in this world at the very present time. Our prayers belong to the vision of the seven seals and the eternal decrees of Jehovah. So prayer is not twisting God's arm to get him to change our mind, his mind. Prayer doesn't mean that God doesn't have his mind made up. It means that prayer is part of God's made-up mind to fulfill his own purposes. So prayer doesn't mean that God is pulled our way to come in line with our desires, but prayer is what pulls us into line with God and his desires. Let me illustrate that a moment. Say you're in a boat and you want to come to land. And you come into the harbor, you throw out a line to the shore, and you, someone takes a line and hooks it for you, and you're anchored. And when the rope is tied to the side of the harbor, you pull on the rope as though you were pulling the harbor to you, as though you were pulling the shore to you. But in fact, you're pulling yourself to the shore. That's what happens in prayer. When we come to pray, we pray as though we're pulling God to us, but we're really pulling ourselves to God. And that's what it means to lay hold on God. You can't bring God into line with your plans, but when you lay hold on God, you bring yourself into his line, and you pull yourself into the will and the purpose of God, and you learn to bow under him and his ways. That's why Martin Luther said prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. You see, prayer is not trying to twist the arm of a a mean God who doesn't want us to be saved. But prayer is laying hold of God's willingness to save. And this is the very thing that gives meaning and significance to prayer. If God were a chameleon-like being, changing color from one day to the next according to our prayer wishes, he'd be an impotent God. 
But in prayer, he changes us. He conforms us to himself. He makes us more Christ-like. And he uses our very prayers to do his will. But notice in verse 3 that it says he actually uses the prayers of all saints. It's not just special people. Special saints he uses. He uses all the prayers of all the saints. They are all registered in heaven's courts. That's another way of saying prayer matters. Prayer is a powerful thing. It's through prayer, through yours and mine, by the grace of God, that God carries out his purposes. That's the point of prayer. And that's why it's in this context. When he unseals the seventh seal, the saints are praying. God is showing, this is the way. I fulfill my own purposes and my decrees through the prayers, through all the prayers of my saints. And that brings us to the second thought. The people, the people who pray, not just the point of prayer, but it's the saints who pray. And you know, of course, that saints does not mean, as Rome teaches us, some special believer, but saints in the New Testament, Haggai, means every single believer. Saint simply is a word that means holy. All believers are made holy in Christ. That means they're made separated from the world. That's what the word holiness means, to be separate from and dedicated to God. That's true of every believer. That's why Paul opened his letters, all the epistles, or nearly all the epistles, speaking to the saints gathered in Ephesus, or Corinthians, or uh, Ephesians. He was saying every believer is a saint. Now, all of this is very important to understand about prayer because it means that God hears the prayers of his people. God is covenanted and bonded to his people to hear their cries. That's not true when you're unconverted. There's no guarantee in the Bible that God will hear the prayers of the unsaved. doesn't mean he won't hear them. You don't dare say that either. The Puritans used to call answers to unbelievers' prayers uncovenanted blessings. And by that, they meant that it sometimes pleases God, though he feels no covenant commitment to do so, to answer the prayers of those who are not yet in the internal essence of the covenant with him by faith. That's why many unconverted people do experience various answers to prayer. They don't know Christ as their Savior, but they can say, well, the Lord helped me here. The Lord answered my prayer there. I've got no other explanation. And that's true. God sometimes in his kindness, his common grace, his sovereignty, hears the cries of unbelievers, but he's not bound to do so. He's not covenanted to do so. But the point, you see, of Revelation 8, this whole passage, is that God hears the cries of the prayers of the saints that are laid upon the altar. God binds himself to hear those cries. He's covenanted himself to hear those cries. Look at what it says. Another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. It was given to him much incense. They should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Which leads me to my third thought on prayer, the place of prayer. Did you notice that? Where these prayers are laid. They're laid on the golden altar before the throne. And that's critical to understand, dear friends. Roman Catholicism takes this text and abuses it and uses it to affirm the doctrine of the abundance of meritorious prayers that the saints lay up. They picture God as some kind of, well, God who has a storehouse of prayers unused in heaven 
and he kind of reaches into his pantry of prayers, as it were. He uses some back stock from the meritorious prayers of the saints to do what he wants to do. But that's not what this means. This simply means that every prayer of every saint is laid upon the altar. It means that when God's people pray, they understand they pray only through the blood and the atoning merits of Jesus Christ. That's why we say, and hopefully it's not just a form saying, for Christ's sake, every prayer is laid upon the altar. All true prayer must come to God through and for the sake of Jesus Christ. Prayer is only prayer when it rests on the altar. And sometimes I'm afraid that when people say things like this, well, I pray to God, but He never answers. I come to church faithfully. I do all the right things, but He never answers. He never hears my cry. Sometimes I wonder, but are you putting your prayers in the right place? Are you putting them in the altar? Are you coming in Jesus and for Jesus' sake, and through Jesus, and based on Jesus alone, because outside of Jesus Christ, we are all sinners. We have no right to be heard. Jesus takes the prayers that are laid on the altar, the bloody altar, and he hears the cries of those who put them there. And that leads us to the forethought, the presentation of our prayers. Let me read verses 3 and 4 again. An angel comes and stands at the altar having a golden censer. There's given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar. That the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascends up before God out of the angel's and, well, the much incense, of course, is the infinite merit of the sufferings and death of Jesus Christ. Christ takes his merits and he mingles them with the prayers of the saints. Charles Spurgeon put it this way, Our great high priest is here represented as standing at the golden altar before the throne of God, having in his hand a golden censer full of incense, the fragrance of which would give acceptance to the prayers of the saints for his sake. So this incense perfumes, it infuses all our prayers, dear child of God. It absorbs completely all that is earthly and fleshly and sinful and selfish. And all that remains is a sweet savor that is acceptable and pleasant in the nostrils of God. That's the symbolism that John is using in this verse. And he's referring, of course, to the intercession of Jesus, how Jesus takes the prayers of the saints, takes the merits of his own suffering, sprinkles that incense upon the prayers of the saints, then prays to the Father, interceding for you, dear child of God, as he presents your prayer to the Father, accepted perfumed, made perfect in the sight of God. And what a glorious comfort that is. If you think about all the foolish prayers you had in 2012, all the empty prayers, all the selfish prayers, all the prayers that you think didn't go above and beyond the ceiling, Jesus Christ takes those very prayers and he infuses them with acceptability in the Father's sight. He makes something big out of something small. He makes something perfect out of something imperfect. He makes something righteous out of something unrighteous. Oh, the precious golden censer, the precious much incense of the great high priest in heaven's courts. Perhaps you've heard that story of a Welsh preacher who once saw a little girl go out into a garden pick a flower bouquet for her mother and bring it back to her mother. But the preacher intercepted the girl because he saw there were clumps of dirt in the bouquet and there were weeds in the bouquet. He said to the child, I'll take out the weeds for you. I'll take out the dirt for you. 
And he did. And so the child went to the mother with a perfect bouquet. Well, that's what the Lord Jesus does for us. He takes out the weeds and the dirt in our prayers, sanctifies them with the much incense of his own sufferings, and makes them presentable to God. And what a comfort this is. We think our prayers are so poor, and God thinks they're beautiful in Christ. What a comfort it was for John on the Isle of Patmos. What a comfort for those who were persecuted in the ancient church to whom he was writing. Some of them were going to be thrown into prison, some cruelly tortured, some martyred. And John wants them to know, and he wants us to know today, that in all our suffering and in all our pain, at times when we can only groan to God and can scarcely get out words, that Jesus Christ knows how to take our groans and sighs and turn them into beautiful prayers in the presence of his Father. I just love this word much here. The angel, which is Christ, the angel of the covenant, Christ takes much incense. He takes his sufferings in abundance, his merits in abundance, because our prayers are so poor. Much incense for so poor prayers to make them right and acceptable and sweet in the eyes of Almighty God. And so that leads us in turn to a fifth thought, the potential of our prayers. The potential of our prayers. You read in verse 2, I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And then in verse 6, and the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. And in between is the prayer, the seventh seal. And so what God is saying here is that when Jesus opens the seventh seal, knowing that this seventh seal will reveal the prayers of the saints, he has the angels ready. And as soon as the seventh seal is open, a new series of visions come, and the angels are ready to blow on their trumpets. They are waiting in attendance upon the prayers of the saints. Now, there are some commentators, and they look at that verse, the seven angels, and they say, well, these are seven special angels right around the throne of God that are waiting on attendance. They're called sometimes presence angels. They stand in the immediate presence of God. And we do know from other places in the Bible that there is a kind of hierarchy among the angels. Gabriel refers to himself as the one who stands in the presence of God. And yet there's a sense, isn't there, in which all the angels stand in the presence of God. The very idea of being an angel is being a ministering angel, a ministering servant of the Most High God. And the fact that the number is seven, which is the number of completeness, and that the book of Revelation uses this number all throughout Remember already in chapter 1, the seven spirits means the fullness, the completeness of the Holy Spirit. It's consistent with this book to say that the number seven here really refers to the fullness of the 10,000s times 10,000s of angels. All the angels stand ready to be sent out by the prayers of the people of God that are accepted by the Father. Now this is a very powerful, powerful image. And we, we believe far too little in prayer. But John is saying here, picture it with me, that when you cry and stammer your imperfect prayer, but you are a believer praying in Jesus Christ, praying on the basis of his bloody atonement, and you lay your poor prayers on the altar of God, that Jesus Christ comes, he sanctifies those prayers, he presents them to the Father, and the Father, for Christ's sake, is going to answer those prayers, and he answers them also through sending out angels to the earth to do his bidding. And the angels are standing there ready to go. 
those holy, exalted angels are standing ready to serve you. In many respects, they're far greater than us. And yet they wait upon us. How is it possible? Well, I read somewhere of someone who gave this example. I think it's a beautiful example. Imagine you were a young prince in a famous country, a little baby, and you were waited upon by lords and women far superior to you. You were inferior to them as far as your attainments, but you were superior to them in your status. After all, you are a prince. You see, that's how God looks upon his people. Dear child of God, you are a king and priest unto God. That's what Revelation 1 said. You remember that? You are a king and priest unto God. True right now, you are spiritually immature yet, perhaps. Perhaps you're an infant king. But God has made us to be kings and priests to God. We belong to the royal blood of heaven. And so God makes his angels to wait on us so that they may, as we ascend our prayers to heaven, carry out those wishes by the response of the Father through the angels. There's a wonderful illustration of that in, in Jesus' story about Lazarus and the rich man. You remember it, boys and girls. The rich man died. That's all it says. He just died. Like Ecclesiastes 8, verse 10. The wicked die and are buried. That's it. But Lazarus was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. God uses the ministry of angels, unseen by his people, to answer the cries of his people. He keeps our feet lest we should dash our foot against the stone. What a comfort for John, an old man on the island of Patmos, near the end of his life, to know that as he cries out with his broken, lonely prayers from the island, there's a host of heavenly hosts waiting to answer those cries. And what a comfort today that God has a battalion of angels ready to take us up, to bear us up. Like the poet said, come, make your wants, your burdens known. He will present them at the throne. And angel bands are waiting there, his messages of love to bear. That's the picture here. I say it with reverence. It's almost as if God has a, has a, like it were a prayer desk. And we put our prayers upon that desk. A desk that is manned by angels. No cold answering service there. But the multitude of angels wait around the throne of grace to carry God's messages of love. That's the potential of prayer. And then finally, we see here the power of prayer. Not only the point of prayer, the people who pray, place of prayer, the presentations of our prayer, the potential of prayer, but the power of prayer. And the angel, verse 5 and 6, took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it to the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake and the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Do you understand what this is saying? It's saying that prayer changes, overthrows governments, confounds human plans, turns the world upside down in the sovereign decree of God. Prayer is a real and effective, powerful force in the world. God is saying here he takes more notice of the prayers of his saints than he does of the resolutions of governments. That's what he's saying. The angel took the censer, filled it with the fire of the altar. He takes that mixture of prayers and his own incense. Having presented to the Father, made it acceptable in the Father's sight, he now casts those prayers down to the earth. And those prayers result in voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. The earth is overturned 
by the prayers of the people of God. What happens here in this building and that chapel, two Wednesday nights every month, Saturday mornings, in God's book, may have more influence in the world than what happens in the White House. Prayer is potent in the eyes of God. And all throughout history, that is confirmed, congregation. What an illustration the very early church history is itself of this truth. John, the New Testament church, were a despised minority. The Roman Empire was powerful. It covered the known world. But what happened only a few centuries later? Rome was no more, and Christianity filled the earth. It was the prayers of the saints that God used to turn the world upside down. And that's exactly what was said of the original apostles in the book of Acts. You remember how they were described. They were described as those who turned the world upside down through prayer, through preaching. Preaching and prayer, God uses in astonishing ways. That was true also in the Reformation, wasn't it? Men like John Knox and his son-in-law, John Wells, were prayer warriors, but also great preachers, and God used them to turn the world of Scotland upside down. It's through the prayers of the people of God that God sends out his thundering, his lightning, and voices that represent his kingdom. And he brings in his kingdom, and the walls of Jericho fall. And God encircles the strongholds of the enemy and brings down the walls of the enemy through the trumps of God. He takes the fires of his prayers of his people and the fiery preaching of his servants, and he hurls it to the earth. And it does amazing things. How we need that at the end, not only of this year, but as we enter another. All we need, those who take the kingdom of heaven by violence, for the violent take it by force. Through earnest prayers laid on the altar of God and through strong preaching of the whole counsel of God. And God can use that in 2013 to send revival to the earth, to turn America upside down. Let that be our prayer. That the God of John, who is the God of today, will answer the cries of his people laid upon the altar. Let's sing first before we look at our second thought from Psalter 172. Praise waits in Zion, Lord, for thee, there we will pay our vow. 172.
Now we can't help but notice that when we move now from the seven seals to the seven trumpets, a whole new series of visions, that the first four seals, which were grouped together, remember the four horses, corresponds to the four trumpets, which are grouped together in chapter 8. At the end of chapter 8, there is a triple woe pronounced, and a pause, as it were, before the worst trumpets are sounded, numbers 5, 6, and 7. The seven seals were for the comfort of the people of God, and they seemed to escalate. The first group of four, and then five, six, and seven, escalating for their comfort. And now the seven trumpets, the first four, express the disaster that shall come upon the ungodly, and then five, six, and seven intensify that disaster, reaching the final judgment. So there's a parallelism here showing us that all of these trumpets are not to be taken physically, literally, but they're all conveying a message. And the message is this, that God will come in imminent judgment, unravel the securities of this world, and if they repent not, they will perish forever. So what God is doing in these four trumpets is actually three things. When the trumpets blow, three things are happening. The first is God is unraveling the securities of the unsaved. If you notice, all the trumpets that blow, there is an unraveling character about it, an unnerving character. First trumpet sounds and hail and fire mixed with blood are hurled down upon the earth, and a third of the earth and of the trees are burned up, and the grass, verse 7. The second trumpet sounds, something like a huge mountain on fire is thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea turns into blood, and the living creatures in the sea, a third of them die, and a third of the ships are destroyed, verses 8 and 9. And then, Similarly, it goes on with the third trumpet. A great star called Wormwood blazes like a torch, falls from the sky on a third of the rivers, a third of the springs of water, and they turn bitter. People die from drinking the poisoned water. And the fourth angel sounds his trumpet, and a third of the sun and of the moon and of the stars turn dark. You feel the intensity. Things are getting bigger and bigger. And a third of the day, a third of the night, are without light. So God is using the earth, the seas, the rivers, the solar system to execute judgment. He's in control over all. He wants to unravel, even through natural disasters, earthquakes and volcanoes and floods and hurricanes and tidal waves and tsunamis and fires. He wants to unravel the securities of a falsely secure world. Everywhere we turn in this chapter, God is unsettling the natural man. And how we see that vividly still today all around us, also in the waning days of 2012, elections this year in America were very unraveling. To think that we elected a president who came out for homosexual marriage and baby killing that states voted for the legalizing of marijuana, that we often felt throughout these days that we lost our nation, that we're now on the very fiscal cliff, and we don't know what's going to happen in the year to come. The Lord is blowing his trumpets in America today. Our worldly securities are being unraveled. The Lord is teaching us don't lean on your own understanding. Don't trust in your own power. Acknowledge me in all your ways, and I will direct all your paths. Now, in the midst of all this, there is something wonderfully comforting for believers, and that is that in the midst of all the unraveling, we stand in holy silence. We stand in awe when we see our prayers being answered. 
Prayer is an empty man of his own self-strength, even though those answers aren't always what we anticipated. But blessed be God, we as believers have a place to go. Not to the praise of man, not to worldly maps, not to earthly glory, not to humanly built towers and temples that will fall to the dust. But we have a place to go even to the angel of the covenant who has our prayers and our tears in his hand and in his bottle. We have a place to go, even to him who sits at God's right hand, who's in control of every kingdom and every power that is, and who has promised that everything built on sand shall perish, but everything built on himself, the rock, shall remain steadfast. And so when we see things unravel, even when we ourselves are impacted, we ought not despair. Actually, we ought to be encouraged because nothing, nothing can bring America, nothing can bring the unsaved to the right place before God without their own security unraveling. How many times when you talk to people of God all around this globe, and you ask them how they were brought into the kingdom of God, they will tell you a story of how God unraveled all their security and broke them down and brought them to nothing so that they needed him. That's what he did to Saul of Tarsus. And that's what he does to believers all around the globe today in all kinds of different ways. No, it doesn't seem sweet. It doesn't seem light. It doesn't seem pleasant at the time. But what a blessing when God causes our whole building to collapse, of our whole building of self-righteousness, and we learn to rest with everything upon Jesus Christ alone. So that's the first thing God does with these trumpets. He unravels our securities. The second thing he's doing is he's pronouncing and giving imminent judgments. The trumpets are warning instruments. You see, the trumpet was used in Old Testament Israel to sound an alarm. It meant an enemy was coming or it meant something dangerous. Trumpets are beautiful instruments, but in Israel, when they heard a trumpet, it was an alarming note. And so here in Revelation, these trumpets are meant to send shivers up and down men's spines. They're meant to sound the alarm. And all four of these trumpets, actually in a very moving way, parallel, again, the Revelation always goes back to the Old Testament, parallel the plagues in Egypt. And the idea you see here is that as God hardened Pharaoh's heart in Egypt under the plagues, but let his people go, so the trumpets in the end times, times in which we live, God sends. It will harden the hearts of the unsaved and they will perish, but it will let his people go and his people will mature under the trumpets of affliction. And so if you turn to Exodus, you find this everywhere, don't you? Revelation 8 verse 7, the first trumpet, it's followed with Hail and fire mingled with blood cast upon the earth. And you look back at Exodus 9. Moses stretched his rod toward heaven. The Lord sent thunder and hail and fire along the ground. So on. Exact parallel. Second trumpet. A mountain burning with fire cast into the sea. And the sea became blood. Exodus 7 verse 20. The Nile is turned into blood. Third trumpet. A great star from heaven burning as it were a lamp. Remember how Exodus 7, the Egyptians could not drink of the water. The water is made bitter by wormwood, Revelation 8 says. The Egyptians could not drink of the water because the Lord made it bitter. The fourth trumpet, verse 12, sounded. The third part of the sun was smitten. The third part of the noon, and it was dark. What was the plague? The plague was there was an Egyptian darkness. 
You see, this is the voice of the prophet in Revelation. He's saying the God of history, the God who intervened in Exodus for his people, that God intervenes now for his people. It will deliver his people all the way to the end. God whispers to us, someone has written in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our conscience, but he shouts to us in our pains. He trumpets to us in times of affliction. Are you noticed when the first set of seals were opened, the seven seals, a quarter of the things were impacted. But now, in the second set, the seven trumpets, a third is impacted. There's a moving toward climax, a moving toward the end time, a moving toward the final judgment. Which leads me to my final theme, the patience of God himself. Unraveling our securities, showing us imminent judgment, and yet being patient. Here we are, nearly 2,000 years later, and the world is not yet destroyed. Oh, the patience of God. How would you have put up with a world for 2,000 years that has so rejected God? How does God do it when he's holy and righteous? Why is he so patient? Well, Peter tells us. We'll hear more about this New Year's morning. But Peter tells us, doesn't he, in 2 Peter 3, many people, he says there, misunderstand the mild implementation of the judgments of God. They say then, well, he won't come again on the clouds because he hasn't come all this while. But God says, a thousand years are as one day to me. I am not slack concerning my promise, but I am long-suffering. That is, I am patient to you, word. That is, to you and me not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And then he adds, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. But see, you see, for 2,000 years, God has been unsealing his secret book, and he's not willing that sinners should perish, but that they should come to the light. He has more elect to gather in and so he's patient in his judgments. The trumpets are sounding. Blessed is he who has the ears to hear and warns and flees from the wrath to come. And yet God is patient to this very moment with you and me. You know when great disaster happens or this year, when the homosexuals made so much ground in their agenda, when marijuana is legalized, and all kinds of disappointing things happened in different places. You shook your head, didn't you? Now, I did. And the first question that you're about to ask is, why does God allow this disaster to happen to a nation that still in many parts of the world is considered to be named with his name? And then the answer we come up with is, well, America has also peddled a lot of smut. America has done so much evil. God is judging us the way he judges people Israel or something of that nature. And it makes sense. But you know what the biggest question is? Why does God allow you and me to go on? We have had so much gospel presented to us in 2012. We should be so much more holy than 99% of the world around us. Why does God allow us, we who are still such great sinners, to go on? Why doesn't he destroy you and me? It's his amazing patience. And John is overwhelmed with this. And yet John realizes, and we'll see that in the next chapter, verse 20, chapter 9, 
But there does come an end. God ends that chapter by saying that those who don't repent will perish. But also this chapter ends with a solemn warning note along these lines. The angel flies through the heavens and cries out with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe. Triple woe for emphasis to the inhabitants of the earth. If you don't repent, the next chapter, the three additional trumpets will be your portion, and the end will be, Revelation 9, verse 20, the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, and they will be destroyed. So the message here is don't try God's patience. Don't try to end this year without Christ. Don't try to begin a new year without Christ. If you're without Christ now, hear his word. Woe, 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 you inhabitor of the earth. Be fearful for the three trumpets yet to sound. In other words, repent. Repent, repent, before Christ comes with a final trump and the gospel door will go shut forever. Amen. Great God of heaven, bless thy word this evening. Cause light to shine in it and through it. Use the prayers of thy saints in this place to hurl down thunders and lightnings upon the earth that may move men to repentance and that may cause thy light to shine and thy kingdom to come. O oh God, have mercy upon our world. Extend thy patience. Dig and dung about thy fig tree one more year, we pray, and give more opportunities for mercy. But, O oh God, please don't let anyone in this dear congregation go lost, but let them repent. Let them believe the gospel. Let them take it to the inner chamber. Let them not rest until they can say, I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is my portion forever. Oh God, bless us. Go with us tomorrow evening as we end the year in thy house and begin with us. On Tuesday morning, we pray a new year that may be dedicated wholly to Thee. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.